In preparing sermons, and those of you that are compatriots, Brother Bill Green, who pastored for years, Brother George Yoder, who pastored for years, Brother David Wade, who pastored for years, and Lake was a ministry, and if I'm overlooking someone, please forgive me. I don't know about you, but the hardest part of getting a sermon together was coming up with a sermon title. It is so challenging to try to come up with something that uh, is, is unique and as my wife says, is not this long. But as I was thinking about a, a title for today's message, out of the clear blue, it just dropped in on me, something old, something new. And that's what I've entitled today's message because I'm going to be talking to you today about a subject that is old, but yet it is something that needs to be revived in today's society. So therefore, I'm presenting it to you as something old that needs to be revisited to become new again among the body of Christ. And I'm talking about the gift of hospitality. The gift of hospitality. You know, we live in a very impersonal society, whether we like to admit it or not. Where I was raised as a, uh, as a child and as a teenager and a young man, uh, in a little community up in the uh, Appalachian Mountains of Western Maryland. It was nothing that if somebody was driving by and they saw you were home, they would stop in. Didn't matter if it was supper time or not. You just added more water to the pot to get my drift. You didn't worry about your house being tidy. You didn't worry about, you know, that everything was spick and span because you were neighbors and you didn't have to worry about them going and talking to your neighbor about, well, when I walked in, you know, their living room was a mess, their kitchen, they had dirty dishes in the sink or whatever. It wasn't that kind of thing at all. But there was a feeling of family that was there. People were very friendly. They were outgoing. I remember that as a kid, when I would play with, with other children around my age and what have you, if I was at another person's home and I misbehaved, they took it upon themselves to discipline me. And when my mom and dad found out about it, they took it upon themselves to discipline me even more. <laughs> they didn't get mad. How dare you, you know, discipline my son or whatever. But we knew that we had many parents, if you will, and we had many people who cared about us and many people who were interested in seeing us grow up to be outstanding, fine citizens with their help and with the rod of correction if the need was there and help us to become the individuals that they would have us to be. But you know, we're living in a day and a time where even in the church, if we're not careful, I can allow it to be a Sunday morning only thing where I see you at church even though I don't know your name, I recognize your face, but as far as having any interaction with you and really getting to know who you are and what's going on in your life and so on and so forth, if we're not careful, we are impersonal. But I want to challenge you today that we revive the gift of hospitality, that we go out of our way to get to know one another outside of the Sunday morning church setting did I say that right? And that we are recognizing that we are family in the truest sense of the word. All children of God. And that God doesn't have you here by chance. But God has placed you here for a specific time. For a specific reason. For a specific person. And if nothing else, to enrich someone else's life by sharing with them who you are as an individual. I want to ask you today if you would stand with me as we turn to God's Word, and let's look together at 1 Peter chapter 4. Notice the words of Peter as he's writing to fellow Christians, beginning to read with verse 8 down through verse 10, and if you'll indulge me, I'll go ahead and read it since it's so brief. Peter says, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. Love will cover a multitude of sins. It's that unconditional love that we were talking about earlier that God has for us. If I truly look at you as a brother, or if I truly look at you as a sister in the body of Christ, just as I would be willing to forgive my biological brother or my biological sisters, 
So I am willing to forgive you and overlook your fault or overlook your uh, offense or overlook whatever it is that may cause a hindrance in me loving you the way that I need to love you so that God's Holy Spirit can move in our midst in our congregation and accomplish the things that he's desiring to do. I don't allow myself to become easily offended. And when you ask for forgiveness, I am quick to forgive just as I would hope that you would forgive me. Verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Lord, today as Trevor prayed, we ask that you would honor us with your presence, Lord, in a mighty way. We recognize our dependency upon you, Holy Spirit, and I would ask you to walk before me into this pulpit. I pray, God, that you would anoint my mind, anoint my mouth, I pray that the words that come forth, Lord, will be words of encouragement, of inspiration, and we will understand your desire for us to truly become a family and care about one another, get to know one another, intercede in prayer on behalf of one another, bear one another's burdens, and be there as a support system as a true family should be for one another. I pray today, God, that your Holy Spirit will move in a mighty way, touch hearts, Whatever needs are present among us, I pray, Lord, that people will walk out of here with assurance of knowing that they've heard from God. And Lord, that we will do our best to truly indeed be visible representation of God's love to this community and beyond. For all that's fulfilled and accomplished, Lord, as a result of you being here, of you doing a mighty work in our hearts and our lives, and most of all, Lord, us being open and yielded and submissive to you. We'll be quick to give you praise, and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, when we mention the subject of hospitality, it often stirs up fear in individuals' minds. It raises many uncomfortable questions. When most Christians hear about the responsibility to practice hospitality, they can think up an amazing number of creative excuses to explain why They are not more hospitable. Yet Christians are commanded in the word of God, not only here in the passage of scripture that we read, but throughout, we are commanded to be hospitable to one another. Hospitality is a crucial element in building Christian community. It may very well be the best means that we have to promote close Christian love for one another. It's especially important in churches that when people come in, they feel a part, they feel welcome, they they feel as though even though they might be a first-time visitor, it's as though they've been there all their life. People go out of their way. It's not just a select few, but individuals go up, they greet them, they welcome them, they want to know if they have any questions, is there something I can do for you, is there some place I can show you that maybe you don't know where it is, but they feel a part and they feel that they are a part of the family of God. You know, In churches, when people first come, they really don't know one another. And sad to say, many relationships are superficial, Sunday morning only relationships. But we need to understand from the very outset that hospitality is a scriptural and biblical command. Many Christians do not realize what the New Testament teaches about this wonderful gift and what it can do for the local church and how it can truly bind individuals together and give you a sense that even though you may be like Bonnie and I, where our immediate family lives several hours away, I know that there are individuals in this church that I can call any hour of the day. And if I was out in Timbuktu, there's no doubt in my mind that they would come to my defense or to my rescue uh, and just as quickly as they could get there. There's no doubt in my mind because they've proven that to me time after time. In Romans chapter 12, verse 13, we read, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, To fully appreciate the significance of the Apostle Paul's words in this brief exhortation, we have to explore the larger context in which it appears, which begins in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. In these verses, Paul urges Christians to present themselves as living sacrifices who are not conformed to this evil world, but are transformed by a godly mind that knows God's will. 
And immediately following these challenging verses of personal dedication, Paul gives specific instructions that explain what it means in a practical everyday lifestyle to have a renewed mind and to live in conformity to God's will. In verses 3 through 8, Paul talks about humility and the exercise of spiritual gifts. Next, he gives a series of short imperative commands that are headed by the theme of love. Notice he says here, let love be without dissimulation, that is hypocrisy. Be kindly affection, that means devoted to one another in brotherly love. So the command to practice hospitality appears within the context of love and sacrificial Christian living. How many of you would agree with me that love and hospitality go together hand in hand? Amen? It's, it's doing just little random acts of kindness. Just letting somebody know that, you know what? I appreciate you. I really value our friendship. I really value you as a friend. I think you're really cool. And I want you to know that I really appreciate the fact that you and I are serving the same God, that we attend the same church, and that we indeed are growing in our understanding of who God is. And as we're walking this Christian journey together, I'm glad I'm not walking it alone, but I'm glad I'm walking it with you that we can be an encouragement to one another. As brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, we are to be a close-knit family. We are to be together. We are to love one another and care for one another. And friends, we cannot do this when the doors of our homes remain closed. Amen? Whatever happened to the day and the time where people could just drop in without making an appointment. You know, I've, I've often said, you don't need an appointment to come to my house. There might be a momentarily delay from the time you ring the doorbell so I can open up the closet and throw a bunch of stuff in there real quick and close the closet door and hope that you won't ask me to hang up your coat or if, if I do take your coat, I'll hang it up somewhere other than the closet that I threw everything into. You know what I'm talking about. But you know, aren't you glad that as you get to know individuals, you don't have to worry about everything being just so-so. You don't have to worry about everything being spick and span. You don't have to worry about the fact that, that you don't have, you know, a, a pot roast in the oven or whatever when they show up that you invite them for dinner. But even if you just have chicken noodle soup on, you can say, would you like some chicken noodle soup and a grilled cheese sandwich? You, you see, what I'm saying is the fact we make it more complicated than what it really is. I mean, I, I don't know all of you here, but I know most of you. We have some visitors here. I know most of you. But one thing I do know is this. I'm privileged as your pastor to be able to visit with you in your homes, and I know how nice you really are. The sad part of it is not everybody here knows how nice you are. Or maybe you're just nice to me, so I won't get up and preach about you. I don't know. But the point that I'm making is the fact that, you know, we need to get to know each other. Now, I can't force it, and I know that. I'm smart enough to know that. I can't force you to go over to somebody and introduce yourself and say, hello, I'm Jeff, and, and you know, you put your name where I put mine, and, and we're so glad to have you here. What is your name? I, I've noticed you've been coming here for, you know, two or three weeks, and I just haven't had the chance to get to you, but I want you to know that, that, that you know, I'm, I'm, even though I don't know your name, I'm praying for you, and don't say it unless you are. Or I will start praying for you. Maybe it's a better way to phrase it. But... But here's the point that I'm making. You know, a lot of times, and, and I want you to take a moment, turn your bulletin over, and you'll notice on the back, every week we list prayer requests. But I'm going to ask you today, how many of you know at least one or two of the individuals that are on the back? And you don't have to raise your hand, but, but you see, the fact of it is this. Many times I have a name, but I don't know the person that the name goes with. It makes a big difference when I'm praying for someone that I know. And I'm concerned about them. I, I don't have to know all the details, but I know enough of the details to know that this person is in need and I'm praying for them. As I said, there's some things that need to be kept in confidence and it's not a gossip column or whatever, but I would challenge you, don't just have us put the name on the back of the bulletin. You read it on Sunday and then you lay the bulletin down. But would you begin to pray over those names at least weekly, if not daily? If your name was there, would you not want someone praying for you? 
So this is how family is created, by getting to know each other, by praying for one another, and to knowing that we are bearing one another's burdens. As we share this and as we grow in the gift of hospitality, we understand, as I said earlier, that love and hospitality always go together. Hospitality, then, is a beautiful expression of our transformed lives being wholly offered to God in surrender to him. Let's not overlook the fact that here in verses 9 through 13 of Romans 12, that they are God-given commands that every Christian in every culture is to practice. It is something that all Christians should be quick to do in obedience to the Lord. The New American Bible, uh, New American Standard Bible, rather, renders Romans 12, 13 as practicing hospitality. And the original, original Greek word of practicing is dioko, which is better rendered strive for or pursue. It, it's something that I'm daily putting into practice. I haven't arrived yet, but when opportunity presents itself, I'm going to look for an opportunity to show you God's love. I'm going to look for an opportunity to be an encourager. I'm going to look for an opportunity that if there's a need in your life, we won't have to wait till Sunday to come to church and, and have the prayer team pray over us or have Pastor Jeff pray over us or one of the board members pray over us. But you and I can stand together in agreement right then, right there, asking of the Father in the name of Jesus and believing as we are standing in agreement in prayer that God is going to do it for his glory. You see, that's what Christian family is all about. That's what hospitality can produce. Now, we don't normally think of pursuing hospitality, but that's exactly what the Bible tells us to do. Greek scholar and expositor C.K. Barrett tries to emphasize the force of the verb by rendering the phrase, practice hospitality with enthusiasm. When was the last time you became enthused about being hospitable? About having somebody show up on your doorstep unannounced right at supper time? And you're looking at what you've prepared and you're thinking, oh goodness, what do I do now? I visited with first comers here at the church. We went out, Trevor and I went to visit them. They had just been seated to eat. We didn't know that when we rang the doorbell. When they came to answer the door, they were all in the kitchen sitting around the table and, and getting ready to partake of the meal. They never missed the beat. They immediately invited us, didn't they, Trevor? They immediately invited us, have you eaten? Would you like to eat with us? That's good old Southern hospitality. You see, we're to pursue it. And pursuit is stronger, more forceful than practicing. In the New Testament, God tells us to pursue righteousness, to follow or pursue that which is good, to seek peace. And here, in 1 Peter, we are to pursue hospitality. We're to think about it. We're to plan for it. We're to prepare for it. Pray about it and seek opportunities to do it. Now listen, you don't have to invite somebody over to your house for dinner, but why not invite them out for a cup of coffee? Why not look for an opportunity to get better acquainted and invite them into your home if you're comfortable with that? But again, looking for ways to get acquainted with other individuals so they're not just a face, but you're able to put a name and a face together and treat them like you would your family. Do we eagerly pursue opportunities to practice hospitality, or is it something that we only do during the holiday season or some other special occasion? You see, the connection between Christian love and hospitality is even more clearly emphasized here in our text. The Christians to whom Peter was writing were facing bitter persecution. If you read verses 12 through 19, you understand that they were being persecuted daily. They were being driven out of their homes. They were being in prison. Many of them were without a place to stay. Many of them were without food to eat and shelter. In face of this pagan hostility, Peter knows that the fervent love and unity among the Christians are essential in keeping them safe during the rough storms of persecution. So Peter urges them to keep fervent in their love for one another. In other words, as you would have them to do unto you, do it unto them. Extend to them the same courtesies that you would hope that they would extend to you if the shoe were on the other foot. And the Greek word for fervent conveys the idea of earnestness, persistent effort, or resolve. Much like the taunt muscle of strenuous and sustained effort of an athlete. It suggests a certain kind of love, a love which endures. You know, as Christians, we should press ourselves to the full extent 
in loving others. Now look, I know it's easy to stand up here and preach this. It's another thing to put it into practice. And can I just go on record so you don't think I'm any different than you are? Sometimes it is a challenge to love someone. Let's just be honest. Come on, it is. There are some people you can get along with. There are some people that, you know, you welcome, you, you look forward to them coming by, and so on and so forth. And then there are others, it's like that relative, you know, that it's just like, oh my goodness, I can't believe they showed up again. You know? You know what I'm talking about. But my Bible tells me that I am to love my fellow man. My Bible tells me that, you know, even though they may not be my favorite, I still need to show them the same courtesies that I would show to the one that is my favorite. Am, am, I, am I just preaching to myself today? Are you with me? Okay, I mean, I, I know you're looking this way, but okay, we just want to make sure. You see, I am a firm believer that if we will become the family of God that God would have us to be, we are going to have the reputation in this valley of being the friendliest church. We're going to have the reputation in this valley of being a church that genuinely cares about people and not just on Sunday morning. That we are going to be a church that exhibits the characteristics of God and not just love, but joy. Are you happy this morning? Are you excited about God? Is he worthy of our praise? Is he worthy of our adoration? I mean, we're celebrating Christmas here in just a few short weeks. God's demonstration of his love. And thank God he didn't show partiality, but he said, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we need to understand the importance of the gift of hospitality. You know, one very practical way to exhibit our love is to show hospitality to one another. Hospitality fuels the flame of love because, you see, sometimes my initial impression is not always true. Sometimes what I thought about you when I first met you is not always the case, but I wouldn't know that unless I spent more time with you. And can I just go on record and say, those of you that are married, you didn't love your husband, you didn't love your wife the first time you met them. <laughs> I do marriage counseling. You fell in love with them over a period of time, did you not? Can I just tell you a story that's kind of comical to me? To, to me? When Bonnie and I were in Bible college, we started out as friends. We had met when we were 12. I was tall and skinny, wore army issue glasses is what she called them, you know. And we had a mutual friend in Baltimore that just thought that we needed to meet each other. So we went to her house because Bonnie had an aunt that lived in Baltimore. I had an aunt that lived in Baltimore. Both my aunt and her aunt were friends with this lady. We were invited over to their house for a New Year's Eve get together. I was introduced. This is Bonnie Kessler from West Virginia. This is Jeff Ferguson from Maryland. Da da da. Hello. How you doing? See you later. Okay. Advance forward four years. 16 years of age. I had been to week one at Potomac Park Youth Camp. I was leaving because of summer football practice. She was coming for week two. This mutual friend was there. She just insisted that we stand in front of the camp speaker's bus, get our picture taken. Again, tall, gangly, if you can imagine. You know, at age 16, 145 pounds of solid bone and muscle, mostly bone. Again, they took a picture, not too impressed. Well, it's amazing how a couple of years change things. So here we are, college freshmen. We're there at the same college. We meet, we become friends, we start talking, we start taking walks. And the thing that's comical is this. One night, as we were saying goodnight, I kissed her goodnight, and we had a friend that saw me kiss her goodnight. And he came up to me and he said, Jeff, he said, you know, I, I just have to ask you something. He said, I noticed the other night you kissed your sister goodnight. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, I noticed you kissed your sister goodnight the other night. I said, what are you talking about? 
He said, well, you do have a sister, don't you? And I said, yeah, I have two. He said, well, I saw you kissing your sister goodnight. I said, my sister doesn't come here. My sister hasn't, I haven't been with my sister for over two months. What are you talking about? He said, that girl that you were kissing, isn't she your sister? I said, no, she's my girlfriend. <laughs> but what I'm saying to you is our initial perception. I saw you, Terry. I know what you said. I'll talk to you after the service. <laughs> Our initial perception is not always the correct one. I'm not going to get to know you unless I spend time with you, unless I fellowship with you, unless I interact. So Peter urges them to keep fervent in their love for one another. We find out that it enriches, it deepens our agape love for one another. Peter naturally follows this exhortation to love fervently with the command to practice hospitality gladly. You see, it's important that we observe the kind of command that Peter delivers here. The command to practice hospitality that he gives here in verse 8 is a one another command, one of many such commands that are found throughout the New Testament. Christians are instructed to love one another, to pray for one another, to serve one another, admonish and edify one another, care for each other, bear one another's burdens. He's speaking of everyday hospitality that is to be demonstrated among the entire Christian family. This is what it means to be part of the life of the body of Christ. You know, I, I really think it's a sad indictment against the, first 20, against the 21st century church that more churches are not known for their hospitality and love. Sadly, most often, only a few families within a local congregation ever share in this wonderful gift of hospitality. Many Christians don't fully realize the degree of love and closeness that is lost when only one or two families practice it. But Scripture exhorts everyone in the local body to practice hospitality in order to fully share in the life of the body of Christ. Now, hospitality means maintaining the right attitude. The main emphasis of Peter's instruction here in verse 9, without grumbling, is that we do it without complaining, or we do it without, you know, a, a haughty attitude, like, oh, here we go again. Because you see, my friend, complaining does not promote love. It does, however, promote disharmony. It does promote discouragement, and it does promote discontent. The opposite of complaining is gladness, the willingness to cheerfully accept the inconvenience, and also to accept the labor and the cost of hospitality. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, we read where God loves a cheerful giver, and hospitality is a form of giving, is it not? Hospitality, therefore, is concrete, down to earth. It's a test of our fervent love for God and for his people. Love can be abstract at times. It can be indistinct. But hospitality is specific and tangible. Hospitality, quite simply put, is love in action. It also defeats the sin of selfishness. At heart, if I'm honest with you and you're honest with me, we all can be selfish at times, can we not? And selfishness is the greatest enemy of hospitality. If I'm honest with you and you're honest with me, we don't like to be inconvenienced. You know, I, I, I think God has a sense of humor. How many times have you been in church and you've said, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll serve you, I'll serve you, I'll serve you. And sure enough, on a cold, rainy night, you've just settled into your easy chair. You're just getting relaxed from the stressful day. The phone rings and somebody's asking you to come and bail them out. You see, it's not always the most convenient of times, is it? But God is saying, do you really mean what you're saying? Do you really love me more than this, that, what have you? We don't like to be inconvenienced. We don't want to share our privacy or our time with others. We're consumed with our personal comforts, and we don't want to be bothered with other individuals' needs. If I'm honest, we can be greedy at times, and we don't want to share our food, our home, or our money. We're afraid that we might be used, that our property might sustain damage. All of these attitudes are selfish. Now, how many of you know that selfishness is sin? 
It's in total opposition to everything that Jesus taught and lived. As our praise team comes, I, I close with this. I think it's imperative that we understand that Jesus lived his entire life to serve others. Did you hear what I said? Jesus lived his entire life to serve others, and so should we. It is only then that you and I will become a church that is known for its love for God and for people. So I want to challenge you this morning, as we are entering into the Christmas season, let's let it begin during this Christmas season, but let's not let it end when the last of the decorations are put away, the last carol has been sung, and the last goodies have been served. But let's keep the gift of hospitality alive here at HFA. Are you with me? Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Let's put the gift of hospitality into action. I want to challenge you today. Don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers also. Take it upon yourself even before you walk out of the door. Like I said, I can't force you. I'm not even going to try. I will hope this is something that you will want to do. Take a look around. Who's somebody that you're curious about? Who's someone that you've noticed from a distance and you know, you just have been waiting for the right opportunity, but you're a little shy and they're a little shy and whatever. Can I just encourage you to go up and if nothing else, introduce yourself to them? And maybe sometime Later down the road, invite them out for a cup of coffee or over to your home, you know, for, for, for some goodies or whatever. But I want to invite you, don't allow this to just be a one-time thing. But let's practice it regularly. And let's be the family of God that God has called us to be. Amen? Amen. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. That's not me saying it. Read it for yourself. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9. Let's look for ways that we can demonstrate God's love to each other and become the family of God that God has called us to be. Pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, we love you today and we thank you so much, Lord, for the instruction of your word. And forgive us, Lord, of the times that we hurriedly read over the parts that we find to be a challenge. Forgive us of the times, Lord, where we choose to ignore instruction. And I pray, God, that you would help us to look for ways to cultivate relationships with one another as the family of God here at HFA. I pray today, Lord, that you will lay it upon our hearts to befriend individuals that many times are overlooked. And I think, into, uh, I, I think especially, Lord, throughout this holiday season of, of those who have recently lost a loved one, those who have lost a mate, and Lord, for the first time, they, they find themselves alone. May we be mindful of that as a church family and reach out in love and compassion. I pray for the ones, Lord, that are least fortunate. May we look for a way to brighten up this wonderful Christmas season for them. And not only, as we said, throughout the holidays, but Lord, may we keep it alive throughout the year. May we be a church that is known as a church that loves God and loves one another would be my prayer. Give us, O oh God, your heart for your people that we may see them through your eyes and look for opportunities to serve. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. So good to have you here this morning. And I trust today that you've been challenged. I know this isn't your typical Sunday morning service, sermon rather. It's not your typical topic that you would hear on, but I think it's something that's very practical. There have been a lot of people won into the kingdom of God, not just by preaching on the love of God, but by demonstrating it. And that's where I'm coming from. I preach on the love of God. If you come here, you know that. I preach on it time after time after time. But I want to put some boots on the ground. I, I, I hope you're hearing my heart this morning. I want us to be, you know, the, the church of God that God would have us to be, the family of God that, that genuinely cares for each other. Now look, we've got a great church. You've heard me say that many times. You're wonderful people, and I'm blessed in the fact that I get to know you by coming and visiting you within your home. Why not let somebody else have the opportunity to get to know what a wonderful person you are? 
by introducing yourself to someone today before walking out of here. That's my prayer. I trust that you'll put it into action and that we will be doers of the word and not hearers only. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you this evening. Should the Lord tarry at 6.30, I will preach a sermon on God's love. So we welcome you to come out, be a part of that. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Stand with me if you would. Our praise team is coming to lead us in a time of worship. Let's just uh, sing a praise of song to the Lord as we go our separate ways.